But with that, I'm going to turn it over to our grand hostess, is Arjana. Here you go. And uh, take it away. Thank you, grand hostess. <laughs> Hostesses, okay. So here comes Fran, the other grand hostess. So we would like to now invite our panelists for our second panel that folks who are doing the execution part of that investment, some are investing actually, so one is investing. So we would like to invite all of our panelists. We have a couple of practicing physicians. I cannot have all of you sit there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, there is. Uh, Miss Manjul? We just don't want to sit next to them. Agree. We're going to close this. And Seth, it, yes, you're up here. We have, I have a question for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> you are in the program. Um, can we close the door here so we can? All right, so welcome. Yeah, we have, it's, it's a full house. So welcome guests, um, panelists. We, um, we would like to start the conversation with you introducing yourself, because you can do a better job than both of us. Um, and then also talk about why today you're talking, we are talking around vitality, how you are in your day job promoting vitality. Sure, so. Hello everybody, Seth Serksner. I'm with uh, United Health Group, I'm part of Optum. So in case you don't know, United Health Group, Fortune 5, $200 billion company, um, about $100 billion in United Healthcare, the insurance, about $100 billion in Optum services. Um, we've got Optum RX, we've got Optum Health, we've got Optum Data. Um, I'm in the health sector particularly. Uh, I spend a lot of time on population health, behavior change, engagement, measurement, uh, quote, thought leadership. Um, and in particular, as relevant to your question, uh, I kind of put our point of view in the research around well-being together. So talk a lot about um, kind of the shift from wellness to well-being. I can get into it as we uh, develop the conversation. There was interesting dialogue around incentives and behavior change. Happen to have a few points of view on that as well. But uh, for now, I will pass the mic, but happy to be here. <laughs> Um, I'm Manjal Shah. I'm uh, founder and CEO of Health IQ. Um, what we do is provide cheaper insurance for health conscious people. And so we started by doing that in life insurance. We've raised about $100 million in financing. Um, and uh, actually recently also launched a new product, not just giving special rates in life insurance for kind of healthy health conscious, but actually for well-managed diabetics. And we actually just got well-managed diabetics the largest uh, discount kind of anybody's ever delivered and in fact rates that are lower than anything they can get pretty much in the country um, so no matter what your absolute level of disease is if you're somebody who's taking care of it and managing it well you know our belief is that you deserve to save money and that that financial incentive will help to inspire uh, more people to be like that um, on a uh, wellness perspective and kind of lifestyle perspective you know we have lots of customers who have kind of gone through transitions lost weight changed their life um, and we focus on the ones that have gone through that transition um, part of that's my own personal story i um, the day literally after i sold my last company i had chest pains and ended up in the er uh, changed my own health nutrition exercise etc lost 40 pounds um, but uh, myself and my co-founders are all people that have gone through kind of health transitions and we you know deal with this with our customers all day long so 
Thanks, Munjil. Hi, everybody. My name is Pankaj Vij. I'm not a VC or a startup guy. I'm, I'm just a practicing physician. And I've been in practice for about 20 years and started making my transition into lifestyle medicine about six or seven years ago. <clears throat> and uh, it really came from the realization, not so much realization, but the frustration of just dispensing pills and, and giving the same advice, sounding like a broken record and feeling like it wasn't really making a difference. So about six years ago, I started what I called my diabetes reversal program at Kaiser Permanente. And I designed on my own this pilot of group appointments where I would take 12 to 15 people with type 2 diabetes who tend to be obese and have high blood pressure and heart problems and all the things that go together with that and walk them through a series of eight weeks where I would see them for about four hours for eight weeks consecutively and really walking them through the nuts and bolts of, of how, what might be causing this problem, how they got to be this way and what they can do to reverse it. And, and surprisingly, the, the outcomes, the results were, were so impressive that this program has grown and now we're looking organization-wide, at least in Northern California, uh, at uh, implementing lifestyle medicine throughout the KP uh, program. We have a really big, robust program that started in South Sacramento with uh, one of my colleagues there called Health Achieved Through Lifestyle Transformation, which again uh, leverages these master levers of health. And it's, it's, it feels like this is the, really the beginning of the story and it's going to get a lot more interesting and fun. So I'm Mr. Dyson, and I'm an investor in ENSO, among other things, just FYI. Uh, I'm very healthy. I do all the right things. It's, I really believe in all this stuff. But I think in Silicon Valley, there's kind of an assumption that, you know, everybody should do that. And if, if they would just all use Fitbits, there wouldn't be this problem. And that's... That is very true, but what I'm doing now is a 10-year nonprofit five community project, not a, not a program, but a project to help create the conditions in which children thrive and which it becomes easier to do this kind of stuff. H how many of you know about the marshmallow test? You know, the, okay, so you give the kid a marshmallow, tell them, sit there, don't eat the marshmallow, and a teacher will come with a second marshmallow. This assumes everybody loves marshmallows, but whatever. But the problem is the kid who eats the first marshmallow is not a bad kid, and he's not genetically predetermined to be lacking in grit. This is most likely a kid who's learned from experience that you can't trust adults, and why should he believe that this guy's going to come back? And if you have that kind of insecure childhood, it becomes very hard to build the resilience that gives you the ability to think long term and to have that vision of the future that enables you to wait for the second marshmallow to not grab the food that's there. Uh, if you don't have a job, well, why not get high? So we're working to try and create the conditions where kids don't get damaged before they become adults. And if you go outside Silicon Valley, you find that's actually fairly common, and I will stop the rant. But that's where I'm beginning. Yeah. Hi, my name is Smalley Patel. I am also a practicing physician. I also advise uh, companies in the digital health space. I became very interested in lifestyle medicine. I didn't even know that was a term, but is as a child, um, saw a lot of family members dealing with chronic diseases and seeing the look on their face when their physician would give them medications instead of lifestyle opportunities. Became very interested in nutrition, uh, specialized in that before I even knew that you could be a physician doing this, and decided to go to medical school largely to practice in this way, although lifestyle medicine wasn't coined as a term at that point. Um, worked as an inpatient physician, as an, academic, as an academic inpatient physician at Stanford, and saw a lot of patients coming in with chronic diseases that could have easily been prevented 
uh, earlier on, and also just looking at physicians and physician wellness, physician well-being and self-care, knowing that you're not really taught a lot of this in medical school. And so uh, went and started to advise companies on the behavioral component, which is massive, I think, in adopting healthy habits for changing chronic disease or in changing chronic disease, and then also practicing on patients. And what I've noticed and the trend that I've seen is that there are younger patients coming in with diseases that I see in the hospital in much later age. And so trying to understand what's going on in our society, what's driving these types of factors, um, and how can we really utilize lifestyle and behavior modifications to uh, get adherence amongst patients. So thank you for having me. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name is Daniel Chow. I am the co-founder and CEO of Halo Neuroscience. Uh, I'm a non-practicing physician, so please don't cast shame on me. Um, uh, I went to Stanford uh, uh, for medical school, master's in neuroscience, um, also from Stanford. And my career professionally has been around developing bioelectronic therapies. So. Um, developing electrical interfaces for the brain, um, uh, specifically for a therapeutic reason. So um, less so about being a Fitbit for your brain, more about like can we use electrons to treat disease. So my last company, uh, we built like a pacemaker for the brain to treat epilepsy, a company called Neuropace. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that was a uh, that was a pretty long, arduous effort, but uh, we produced a. Uh, an FDA approved device that is out there in clinical practice. Um, just recently, last month, they released nine year data. And I'm proud to say that the responder rate for this, for this product is 75%. Um, I mean, and to think you could, and, and these are severely epileptic drug refractory patients. Um, the success rate in this patient group is in the low 30s at best. So this is, I, I, I only, I, I bring this up as, um, Exhibit A for using electrons as medicine for the brain in a way that you couldn't even dream of with a drug. And so I, I know um, when people think about neurostimulation and electrons in the brain, they think about one flew or the cuckoo's nest and things like that. <laughs> uh, so like, I hope you can just for a second um, like, uh, 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 take, your way, take yourself away from popular culture and like um, think more rationally about the way the brain works, the way the, the brain works um, through electricity. It's an electrical organ, and there's an opportunity to use electricity to interface with the brain um, for, uh, for therapeutic goods. So um, uh, HALO obviously does not make um, uh, uh, medical implants like my last company. We make wearable products that do more or less the same thing. Uh, we use uh, electric fields to interface with neurons to modulate circuitry uh, to our advantage. So uh, this, this product is um, our first and only product for now. It's called Halo Sport, and we sell uh, this product to athletes to help them learn movement faster, to stimulate temporary states of hyperlearning in their motor cortex as part of the brain that controls movement. And if you pair that with movement training, you will learn that movement faster. So. Think about athletes, think about musicians, think about surgeons, um, think about the military, uh, think about someone who just had a stroke and needs to learn to walk again. Um, so anybody who practices movement um, for either recovery from a disease or to get better so that they make more money in a sport or whatever, um, those are our people. So Daniel, that's actually um, apropos because the question I'm going to first raise is around digital therapeutics. So that is sort of from the um, you know the end of the technology sort of folks who are driving messages within um, AI, the terminology referred to as digital therapeutics. And when we look at it from a forecasting perspective, today we're at like you know less than 10 percent. And those that are doing it are in areas like neurosurgery. We see the most adoption of digital therapeutic solutions. The projections are in five years, there'll be about 25% of physicians who will be prescribing these types of products. 
I'm curious to know from the panel, and we can maybe we'll go to the next and come around, or whoever feels most inclined, what your thoughts are around the adopt, how are you today adopting digital uh, therapies within your uh, practices, and um, what kind of uh, what kind of decisions do you do you go through? What kind of process do you go through in the decision making of onboarding such types of solutions? Uh, it's a great question. I think it depends on the patient. If you have a young patient who's very technologically savvy, I think that you can do more. They're, they tend to be a little bit more into um, gamifying healthcare, and so uh, I think that there's an application. But I always notice that it goes back to bringing the science behind it. So it may be fun for a little bit, but they'll get bored or they want to move on to something else. And so something like Headspace is actually a great example of how you can actually explain the science behind the motivation to want to meditate. And it's more just getting into the mindset of being present and slowing your brain down a little bit to allow for chronic stress to start to slow down, which we're seeing so much more of. Um, in the hospital, I remember we tried to adopt iPads for patients. And there's so much going on. I mean, you're losing your identity as a patient in the hospital. And I sat on the patient experience committee and it was almost too much and overwhelming for a lot of patients to come in and have to deal with, A, their medical condition, which they don't know about, five different doctors coming into the room and now here's an iPad, figure it out, and you can track. And so it's interesting and I think ultimately the, the goal is the same in terms of decreasing delirium, but almost actually increased it and increased confusion. Um, and so that's a slower adoption. So I think you really need to know your audience, so to speak. And the physicians also need to be onboarded because there's so much out there. Um, and I think the physician component is really important when you are adopting these types of modalities for patients. So there, there's so many different ways to answer that question. And you, you'll hear a bunch of them. I've got just three points that focus mostly on this quote adherence engagement question. Uh, first, I ran into this amazing product that doesn't yet exist. It's in the works from Ideas42 called Virgil. It's around what do you do? You've come out of jail, you're on parole, and there are certain things you want to do and certain things you shouldn't do, and it's really hard. And one of the first things the user is encouraged to do it's, and this word gamification, I think, sends people off into bingo, and this is very different, but who knows better than me what it is that I'm susceptible to? You know, Friday night, like seven o'clock, I just need a drink, and I know that. So on Wednesday, I can interact with the app and sort of have my long-term self know what to do to this short-term self. And at 6.30 on Friday, get movie tickets or, you know, make sure I've got a meeting with some friends. You know, it's, it's sort of, there's a lot of this interplay between the long-term and the short-term self. Second, there's the whole framing effect. If you want someone to do the right thing, again, you need to do the precision motivation. Are they doing it for their kids? Are they doing it to be better than the guy next door? Are they doing it to show their dad? Are they doing it because they're scared of getting sick? You know, again, put, put that context around. It makes the behavior easier. And then the third, this was a wonderful study by Deborah Estrin, who's Judy Estrin's sister, the Cisco lady. Uh, if you order your groceries or your videos two or three days in advance, they're likely to be healthier or more intellectual. If you pick them up on the way home, forget it. And some of you may know, American Airlines lets you order your meals in advance. I once called the American Airlines PR people to ask them, did they see a difference? And <laughs> she told me she couldn't answer, but somebody who knows somebody in the airline business, it would be really interesting. <laughs> As we think about lifestyle as a drug, I think there's many ways where digital health uh, can be applied and it's actually already being applied. But we need to keep in mind that 
motivating somebody to change the way they live is not just, can, cannot just be solved by high tech, it also needs high touch. And uh, you know, a digital solution to that might be that your health coach, your physician, your uh, mindfulness coach, your dietitian, your exercise coach is available to you remotely on, on your screen or on your iPad, regardless of whether you're a millennial or someone in their 60s with an iPad. That, you know, that, that's one place where it's being used very well probably with some hybrid of high touch contact as well. So it could be uh, avatars or, or live person interacting uh, in a digital manner, but then somehow combining that with contact with someone that they trust and know that, that in that combination it could help motivate and move someone and keep them in that right direction, keep them away from the bar at 7 o'clock on Friday and instead eating broccoli. <laughs> um, you know, when I look at this, very few apps have really been successful. I mean, Mindspace is kind of the exception to the rule. How many people you know still wear their Fitbit? Not very many. And so I feel like when a lot of people, yeah, except for Esther. So, um, and the rest of us wear it by accident, <laughs> right? And um, so I think because we have this technology, we've tried to say kind of we have this hammer, now everything's a nail. Like, and, and, some, and I think actually we've taken a, a bunch of approaches that are just wrong. You know, one of the insights we had quite a while ago was that um, we shouldn't focus on behavior change, which is a crazy thing that everybody in here is so paternalistic and says we got to change them and we got to save them. We believe behavior acceleration is where to focus, not behavior change. The person has to flip on their own. There has to be some self-responsibility left in the system. Not everybody's a victim. Okay, so that's like one big paradigm shift that I think all these solutions have to make before they'll be efficacious. Second is we keep focusing on self-control instead of environment. I mean, anybody who's lost weight knows you do not lose weight by just having self-control. This marshmallow test thing is bogus in a way that, in an, and I do believe that, like, you got to get all the sugar out of your house if you want to lose weight. <laughs> Nobody has perfect self-control. you got to get it all out of your office because you can't. You, everybody's going to have a bad meeting at some point in the week. And you're going to walk out and be like, oh, maybe I will just have half that cookie. And so I think that's the second part, which is in every environment, we have to be willing to take things out. But we're unwilling to take things out of the environment. So therefore, we focus on self-control. I think the third. Uh, uh, element that we see is we keep focusing on small actions when actually a lot of the science shows high intensity is way better in almost every dimension. You know, and so yeah, let's just take our 10,000 steps. You know, we have treadmill desks in our office where literally I have probably, there's days I've walked six hours because I had six hours worth of meetings, like day after day after day. Do you know how many pounds I lost from that? <laughs> Zero. But a little bit of really fast sprinting kind of made a, lot, a much bigger difference. Heavy lifting made a bigger difference. Even dietary extreme stuff, like intermittent fasting or fasting totally. If you've never done it, like I strongly recommend trying fasting. It, it seems these highly intense things trigger something different than kind of thing. But we keep encouraging people, oh, just take a few steps because that's easy. It's hard to tell them to do the other stuff. And lastly, we keep going for what we can measure in these devices instead of what's important to measure. So if you've never done it, go and wear a continuous glucose meter for a month. It is the most educational, nutritional thing you can do in your entire life. And I've done this numerous times in a row now. And I am constantly surprised at how high my blood sugar spikes from things I did not think were going to spike my blood sugar. You know. The sushi, six pieces of a California roll, spiked my blood sugar as much as the ice cream with chocolate on it. You would not have guessed that, but I mean, I have the data. It absolutely did. And I'm like, oh, it's sushi. It's fairly healthy. As soon as you, but we keep focusing on the things that are easy, that are in our Fitbit, instead of the things that are important. 
And some of those things can make a bigger nutritional thing and teach people faster and give them the feedback loop they actually need. I just want to second, I think every second grade class should wear a CGM for a month or two. Stanford wants to sponsor that. <laughs> so I'll just make a quick couple comments. It, it's a pretty broad definition of digital therapeutics because as you started, your neuroscience thing goes, that to me was pretty specific. And as we would analyze that as an option, it would be all about the comments around data. It would have to be proven in a very clinically rigorous way at scale. So I think that's where we start to see that. There are many big problems, many things that it could apply to. As you start to broaden the idea of what's a digital health, digital modalities, that really varies. I think part of it, when I look at digital products, I do look at the behavior change science. And uh, part of it is, we've been talking about incentives. I would talk more about motivational design. I would talk about sense of purpose. The literature on sense of purpose is really important right now. So. Um, while it's great to work with the people who are motivated today in doing things, it is also really helpful to talk to those people about what might motivate them. What's their sense of purpose? Why would they care? Why would they bother to be adherent? So using a model behavior change that talks about the first step of self-awareness, the second step of skill building, and the third step of maintenance or sustainability. Many of the products that are being developed focus on skill building, don't even use the best science for that don't even bother talking about maintenance. We know a lot about maintenance. We know a lot about self-identity. We know a lot about designing for failure. So as you think about and as we vet the services, the applications, we see the technologies, we ask, what's the behavioral science behind it? What is the data driving personalized recommendations? How simple is it? What is the consumer experience behind all of this? And how does it integrate across the ecosystem? So for a provider, it's got to be just part of your deal. We have a product called Pre, uh, Prescript or something like that, where it pre-authorizes the, the med right there so the consumer doesn't have to worry about it, the doc knows, lower option, boom. It's just part of the EMR. It's just part of the process. So thinking about integration within the ecosystem is critical. Um, lots of other examples. One I'll give you in the digital space a uh, company called MindStrong, not if you're familiar with that, but so it just, it monitors how you play with your phone all day long, collects that data, and then starts to understand, and this is particularly for people with substance abuse and mental health issues, it will start to give you an alert to say, you've been on, <laughs> let's do something about that. So there are um, ways that are very passive and that help uh, with the data that we're already collecting. So I'll leave it at that for you. Thank you. This was very insightful to see that we are knowing what we are collecting, but we have to collect what we don't know. It's almost like passive and uh, things that we should be measuring, we are not measuring. So my question is, and I'll begin with Esther because you're actually looking at larger population. I'm in the population health space and I would like to hear more. Um, they say that the zip code that you live in has far more impact on your health outcome than the genes that you were born with. So I would like to hear from all of you, but I would like to begin with what you are seeing in your project. Uh, basically, it's true. I mean, in, in Muskegon, for example, there is, it's not a fashionable term anymore, but there's what amounts to a ghetto, Muskegon Heights, and they measure the crime rate per 10,000 versus per 100,000. And you know, in other parts of Muskegon, it's much nicer, much whiter, uh, and the disparities are huge in outcomes. But you know, if you, I mean, we're not in the business of doing experiments on people, so we haven't taken anybody out of Muskegon Heights and transplanted them to Norton Shores. Mm -hmm. But the, it's it's not unique to our places. Uh, the situation you grew up in, your access to food. You know, no, not everybody's a victim, but at the same time, there's, if you can't get healthy food, you know, I'm sorry, that's not your fault. And it doesn't mean that all we need to do is just bus in food. People, 
it's very, very complicated. But people's futures are determined. I mean, Kaiser Permanente, the, the other interesting work that was done there was by Vincent Felitti, who studied adverse childhood experiences. And those, you have people who seem to be okay, and then at 30, suddenly something explodes. Others get into trouble much earlier. But if you have, if you're missing parents, if one or both of your parents are addicted to something, if somebody's in jail, your chances of all these things going wrong for yourself, it's kind of this depressing linear curve. I think that that's a completely fair point. And when it comes to high tech in terms of digital uh, electronic health records being accessible to patients, population health plays a huge role in which patients are actually on their phones versus which patients have access to other ways of getting their health records and how important that is in driving outcomes. And I think we see that in the hospital and outside of the hospital as well. But patients coming in from a, in a county setting um, may not have the access and it's actually really important, but they may be on their phones because translation is actually easier done on their phones. And so how do you get them access? That will actually drive better outcomes for them while they're in the hospital when you have <coughs> such a limited time because you may be the last provider that they see before they disappear. Um, I think jail systems is a great example of that as well. How do you uh, have inmates have access when they come into the hospital? How do you c keep track of their records? How do they keep track of their records so that when they are finally discharged from the hospital and subsequently discharged from prison, they actually have an idea in terms of their outcomes? So I think it plays a massive role. I want to follow it up with the with a question that I want to add on is like what are the interventions that has been done that is successful? So I would like all of you to address that. So we know the zip code matters, but what are the success stories attached? To Let me give you a couple quick ones. So social disparities in health <laughs> and health equity is a very hot topic. Um, community context, blue zones, all that stuff. We we have a lot of information about that. So for example, in the Medicaid populations around maternity health, we've seen great success with some um, baby text apps, right? Where you're, it's just pretty darn simple. But texting around that, baby blocks or whatever it's called, um, big success with that kind of thing. The other piece to that is that social disparities in health and social isolation go together quite a bit. So we have an index on social isolation, and we know when someone is, we know they're at risk for many, many things. In fact, if they smoke and they're lonely, I'd rather them get a friend than quit smoking. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do then is we literally do outreach, and in this case, we go to their home. We have house calls. We do over a million house calls to people who are in social isolation, do assessments. If they need uh, to adjust the environment, to your point, we'll help them adjust the environment. We'll provide issues to, uh, to overcome their barriers. So just a few specifics to that. Not all technology, though, in this case. Actually, talking about, um, sorry, going back to your previous question for a second on the zip code. So we recently did an analysis because part of how we started the company was we actually wrote a health IQ test and we got millions of people to take it. And so we actually have this data set that shows basically health literacy across the country, zip code by zip code by zip code. The other day I was looking for something <laughs> and so we ran this report and actually we're going to put out this infographic. Um, and we said, hey, what's the disparity between genders? And we you know, expected the normal thing that you would see of you know, typically um, you know, lower scores in women and higher scores in men. And, and we looked at it by state. And yeah, we found. Yeah, this is health literacy. Well, good. You guys are all very educated. So, so what we found was the exact opposite. So in every single state but one, for reasons I cannot explain, um, basically there's a gender gap in literacy where the men are less literate. Except interestingly, the poorer the state, the bigger that gap or the smaller that gap? The poorer the state, the bigger the gap or the smaller the gap? The bigger the gap. And so we're starting to be able to get, and, and a lot of this literacy is the foundation. I mean, yeah. knowing isn't doing, but you can't do what you don't know. Right? And so um, there's this very, like we're starting to be able to look at the data, look at it more clearly and see areas. We also found there are a number of geographies 
where you have this inverse relationship. Normally high income equals high health literacy and low income equals low health literacy. There's these weird pockets all over the country where you have low income and high health literacy. And so we're starting to try to figure out, well, why, why is that? Like, what happened in these pockets? Is there something we could replicate to other pockets? Like, we don't have to just ex uh, accept the normal orthodoxy of this. Let's let the data tell us, and let's let the data help us find these kind of contrarian uh, things that we can see. And maybe there's an insight in that as well. Not always. Some of the ones we found were just university towns. And so we're like, yeah, that didn't teach us anything. It just told us there's a bunch of 26-year-olds who make, or, you know, 22-year-olds who make no income. <laughs> but are you know, very well educated. So um, that's, a, uh, that's some of it, but we've, we're looking at the data kind of in a whole, very different way around literacy. I'd like to know you started with the presumptions in the first place. Yeah. I'm sorry? I'd like to know who started the presumptions in the first place. About what? The gender bias. Oh, the gender bias. That's, for, uh, that's a good topic, perhaps, for another Let's day. <laughs> um, that's a whole other. So in, in terms of validated success, probably the gold standard. There's a website, samhsa.gov, S-A-M-H-S-A, -S -S I think. I can't remember what it stands for. Yeah. But they, they have a listing of the best things. Probably the very best one is Nurse Family Partnership, which focuses on, quote, high-risk pregnant, first-time pregnant women. And it gives them a visiting nurse who stays with them through two years. and Peter Orsag from the Office of Management Budget and a whole lot of people swear by this thing. It gives you about a seven times financial return in something like 20 years. So it's, it's like if you're rich and you don't want to pay taxes, you should pay taxes for this because you'll pay less taxes later. And these kids who come out from what would have been a very risky circumstance they're more likely to finish school, less likely to get pregnant or get someone else pregnant, less likely to get addicted, more likely to get a job. And it all goes back to that initial resilience. And it really works. And it makes you able to listen to the advice and pay more attention to it and so forth. Yeah, and I wonder, like, part of the, the gender disparity is could be that the support that a woman gets when she is transferring to become a, a mother. And uh, yes. I mean, and then just wait until something really stops working. <laughs> <laughs> another, another day. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to, just to comment on you know, this idea of um, you know, you're a product of your community um, uh, and less so about your genetics. Um, I, I mean, I. I I see that from the brain's perspective in the way community behavior shapes individual behavior. Um, and, I, you know, you look at, uh, I mean, you, you look at communities today and, um, you know, there's, there's uh, dietary behavior that you might even have healthy choices, but in certain communities, um, it's just not done. It's the unhealthy choice that is the behavior, that's the default behavior. So it's hard to be the only one around other people that are behaving differently. And I mean, I live in San Francisco and everything's organic, right? Everything's like whole fresh fruits and then and then. I'm the parent that's bringing a Snickers bar, handing it out to kids on, and you know, I'm the bad guy and that's good, right? Because but, so like there's social policing around me and um, like now I behave because like, hey, Dan, you shouldn't be giving those things out. So that, that's awesome, but you know, the reverse is true in other neighborhoods where you know, those types of practices aren't happening. So like, I go back to um, like, you know, what is the psychology or the neuroscience behind decision making? And you know, at some point, it's like resisting temptation. Like at some point, you just break, right? There's only so much a mind can handle before you can't be contrarian for that long and you just break. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's like a neuroscience um, skill called uh, cognitive control. And this is our ability to, um, like, to control our thoughts, to do the things we want to do, to resist temptation. And I would argue that today, um, the temptation to do other things that are off topic is as high as, as it's ever been in humanity. And it's because of this thing that sits in our pocket constantly. I mean, that is just pushing us to the limit such that 
maybe by the middle of the day or the end of the day, you just have no more cognitive control, right? Like you're short, short tempered, you make worse decisions. Like, how can I have the burger? Forget it. It's been a day. But half of that problem was like self inflicted because you've been messing around on your phone for too long. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. I just, uh, and, and you know, to bring it full circle with children and community, like uh, I just read in the New York Times, like, what are the most high tech cities doing with devices and children? They're taking them away. Like, paradoxically, they're, they're like chalkboards, no iPads. And yet, in uh, you know more disadvantaged neighborhoods, it's like oh, let's shower them with electronic devices. Now the future will will tell like which is the right approach. Jury's still out. If I were a betting man, and I am, um, I, I would I would bet that uh, uh, it wasn't like it, it would the approach of going analog with children is the right approach. Uh, but time will tell. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm a believer that uh, your zip code matters in your DNA. Esther mentioned uh, Vince Valeri's work. Uh, there's tons and tons of research actually done on zip code. The most recent one that comes to mind is with congestive heart failure. Patients that are hospitalized for heart failure, meaning that their heart doesn't pump well, uh, are advised when they leave the hospital to eat a low salt diet, to avoid processed food, to eat more vegetables. And there's a clear correlation with zip code and readmission to the hospital with congestive heart failure because we know that certain pockets are food deserts and that, that actually, that research correlates really well with obesity as well. When you mentioned, you know, the poor states, the southern states, everybody knows where we have the highest obesity and these are the places where, you know, the city design is different, people don't have access, even if they had the information, they physically don't have the access to that. And what we can do about it, where one really cool experiment that's going on is the Blue Zones project, mm -hmm. a health ways project which I think Blue Cross is involved with where they're actually redesigning cities. So what if we design a city that gets people access to these things that we know are good for health, that gets them access to fresh fruits and vegetables, that has walking spaces, that has parks where people can go and relax and socialize with others, uh, that can really make a difference. So that's something that we can do about it. I really appreciate that, um, those final comments, because there uh, is a pocket, a community within Queens, New York, where that is just the case where they have uh, created a community, predominantly older adults, um, very diverse population, very low income, a lot of uh, dual el eligibles, and yet uh, they have uh, very good outcomes in that, in that community, but it's because it's conducive to all the things that we've referred to. So I wanna switch gears. How are we on time? We're good? We're good on time? I don't know where our, t I thought our timekeeper, I, you disappeared, I thought you gave up on us. <laughs> I looked up, you weren't there, I was like, oh no, she's giving up on us. Okay, um, so we've talked about, you know, the community, we've talked about provider to patient. I wanna talk a little bit about peer to peer. Uh, you know, I'm, I actually f flew into this, conf this event from another event, which is going on, and I gotta fly back out there again tonight. It's the AI med, literally, 10, 10 o'clock flight. I know, I got, this is that stuff. Um, but I'm coping. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're talking about artificial intelligence and medicine. So we're another group. There are a lot of, of physicians, clinicians, I should say, um, and, who are out there who are very much wanting to make a change. But I'm curious to know what, have, what is the conversation like when you're having a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee with your colleagues, the conversation around the change, the change in the way that you practice medicine. Yeah, um, I, okay, I trained in an era where electronic health records were being put, put in while paper records were being put out, and my attendings at the time were really disgruntled because they were not able to be part of that adoption system. And so I think we have a bad taste in our mouth, even as trainees, from that time in terms of EHR, even though you do realize that it does make your lives easier and it helps patient outcomes, but just from the onboarding standpoint was actually very negative. And so I grew, I trained in an, in an era where it was very tech phobic. And so I grew to not enjoy technology until I realized that there's actually a lot of empathetic digital health that can drive outcomes. And so um, I hear a lot of physicians, and I do a lot with physician wellness and physician burnout and looking at what drives that. 
and a lot of it is, you know, this digital health fatigue in, in certain ways, but when you're talking with your colleagues about it, it's just a lack of understanding. And so when you discuss, well, actually, like, AI can help with your flexibility at some point, and AI scheduling can actually help figure out shifts in the hospital, it changes the conversation. And so I, it, it's, there's a lack of knowledge amongst my peers, in my experience, I don't know if you've had the same, but um, with the amount of technology that can actually help and then also wanting to motivate physicians to get involved in the, uh, the design of it because you can only complain so much without doing something. And so it just kind of empower yourself a little bit and have a seat at the table and drive a lot of these things. If you're curious or if you want something, they're probably building it. And so ask for it because ultimately it can actually make your, your, your job as a clinician that much more fulfilling um, and that much easier. So there, there are different meanings, perhaps, of peer-to-peer, -peer, and I have two thoughts of mine. One is back there are the two people from Supportive, which I'm an investor in, that I think, Bambi, you had them in an earlier session. And this is online peer-based counseling for mental health, the, which I think is great. That's why I invested and so forth. Uh, the second is interesting, it's Meetup, which I was on the board of till it was acquired by WeWork. And I'm trying to get somebody to start using Meetup as kind of an alumni network maintenance tool for people who've gone through, you know, whether it's a pre-diabetes curriculum or you know, a support group of people with a substance use problem or people working together on hearts or exercise or something like that. But this interaction with other people. So, Esther, to keep us on, on point, in this context, what I would like to challenge, if you don't mind, sure. uh, to think about is when you're working in a community yeah. and you're having to work with stakeholders, because essentially, that's why I went to clinician and not just physician, right? Because there are a lot of players, there are a lot of stakeholders, there are a lot of influencers, and the change that's occurring or not occurring within communities. So if you think about it from that perspective, when you have conversations with the influencers, the decision makers, who are directly, uh, in, some, in some respects, co-responsible for what's happening in their environment, what is the conversation like? Are they, res are they, are they just smiling and nodding? Are they, and actually you're, you're really spot on when you said, Clinicians don't know what, the majority of clinicians do not know what digital therapeutic, therapeutics means. They're unaware of what the definition is. Less than 35% do. What is it like when you're working with these leaders and communities? Well, I mean, first of all, we're not going in saying you should be using digital therapeutics. And we're not suggesting. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I honestly don't really understand what the question is. So... I mean, to be clear, most of what we're trying to do is before people ever hit a hospital. I mean, nurse family partnership involves nurses, but it has, it's schools, it's how the police deal with people coming out of jail. Uh, and we, we Wellville, we're not, you know, as I said, it's not this nice white lady coming to help in the neighborhood. It's the nice white lady talking to the people who are trying to help in the neighborhood, but need better tools of accountability they need. I mean, to some extent, I think a lot of health creation and delivery is going to be more like a franchise model where somebody, whether it's nurse family partnership or meetup training organizers or someone training nutritionists or whatever, train the local people. So number one, you add jobs and then train them to work with their peers around whatever the particular topic is, whether it's child rearing or caring, you know, running after school sports things or something. But, you know, we, we do it with food preparation. We do it with Starbucks. Why don't we do it with knowledge of how to live a healthy life? And why don't we pay for it? That's the real issue. In this case, we go after the practices that share our values in culture. We don't try to go uphill. So these are enabled, electronic, digital, uh, consumer experience, 
Nordstrom customer service model types of approaches, primary care teams. So the adoption with, in our case, not advertising, but the Optum engines, our Optum 360, what we do empowers that, the AI and everything that we do from the data behind and the analytics to the front end delivery. So that piece, um, and yet it's still not a culture of health always, and so there's a, a bit of a, uh, a process there as well when we try to integrate these groups. But we look at the variation across the country on that, and then we try to kind of solve for it. On the peer-to-peer, -peer, um, absolutely agree. There is all the data in the world that says that while people like social support, they want that person who went through that war just like they did to work with them. And we have a lot of good experience with digital communities to do that. On Rally Health, we have digital communities that people sign up for. There's many different models for it. I'm sure you guys have a way to do it. Um, I think it's a very powerful piece of the equation. <laughs> I was going to answer it a little bit differently in, peer, in my peers, right? So. Um, I'm also involved with physician health and wellness. And physician burnout is a, is a big crisis right now. So this system that we have is broken. It's not really working. It's not working for the consumers. It's also not working for the providers very well. I don't know about the payers. The payers seem to be doing pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> At least. It's not working for anybody. <laughs> um, all the three Ps I'm doing. OK, we won't, we won't single anybody out. Uh, but on the pro in our organization, we're looking at joy and meaning in medicine, and you know having that the joy and meaning comes from doing something that's actually impactful and meaningful. And 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 this stuff that we're talking about is tremendously impactful and and very very meaningful. And everybody that I talk, I mean, some people sneer and 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 snicker, but you know, below the surface, they also know that this. This is the way, this is the only way that we can really make an impact on the community, on the people that we serve, and ourselves too. And uh, I know we've kind of been skirting the question of motivation for behavior change and so on. And one of the biggest drivers of that is the behavior of the person giving that advice. So if you're talking to a doctor who's a cyclist, he's probably going to talk about exercise. The exercise that he'll talk about is cycling. If it's someone who's a mountain climber, he's going to talk about mountain climbing. If he doesn't do anything, or she, then they're unlikely to talk about lifestyle. Or so, if they smoke. Or if they smoke, they're absolutely not going there. Why is, you know, one thing is, is, why is there such a premise that the distribution of this health information has to come through the medical system and through the clinicians inherent there? If you look at how most of us have learned our healthy habits and things, Nine times out of ten, if I ask you, where'd you get first hear that, you'll say, oh, this friend of mine who's really in the health. Or parents. Or my or parents. parents. Or folk. Yeah, right? There's true. a folk transmission here that somehow, it, it passes bad information too, by the way. Like, it's not a perfect system. But it seems to be a way that we absorb information around health easier and better than kind of a formal um, kind of authority figure sort of relationship. And so, um, you know, when we ask a lot of our users at Health IQ, like, where'd you learn that? Where'd you learn that? Where'd you learn that? So much of the time you get, like, they find what I call a super node. There's somebody in their friend circle who is the health nerd, mm -hmm. who reads everything, who does everything. And, and at cocktail parties now as you get older, as you know, as I entered my 40s, like, you talk about three topics, right? School, real estate, and basically health. And then as you go to your 50s, from what I understand, like, it's like half the time help. And so, a friend told me that. So the, um, but it just increases and increases and increases. And so this is how information's passed. Why aren't we building infrastructure to pass information this way? I will say though, I, I agree that there is, and I mean, I have friends who probably know way more about certain things, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. And if I could pay, if I could pay myself the amount of times that a patient comes in and is like, well, Dr. Oz was, you know, talking about Garcinia Cambocha as a weight loss supplement, I'm like, well, 
That's not even a thing. I mean, you know, that's not, I mean, if you want your heart to speed up and you want it to like, then go snort cocaine. Like I, you're coming to me for actual advice. And I agree that physicians don't know everything. And I think that's why it's great to see cl clinicians pushing, you know, lifestyle medicine, because I think that there's a, a, a responsibility to learn about this because your patients still trust you at the end of the day. And so, and you're still that trusted person to dispense that advice. It doesn't matter what your friend is doing and how good they look and what kind of plastic surgery they got to get that way. And now we're saying that they're drinking like the best green tea they've ever found. But I think that, you know, but I, I, think, I think that there, it really is. I mean, I think you're, you're responsible as a provider and that's not gonna change anytime soon to really dispense. And so it's up to you to keep up to date and sift through that data in a world where there's so much on, you know, I Google, Dr. Google's everywhere and it's like, well, they didn't tell me. I mean, I had a patient the other day who was like, I intermittently fast. And I was like, okay, what does that mean to you? Well, I've always skipped breakfast my entire life. I was like, well, you're still a diabetic, so you're not really doing it correctly. Um, you know, I just think that there's a lot to sift through. So, so you know, I, I, I still think that Unfortunately or fortunately, clinicians are still the authority and their patients are coming to them for that affirmation, confirmation, et cetera, and we are responsible to push that along. I think I agree with that and I, I do believe that the model of delivery of health literacy has now put been put on the shoulder of uh, the healthcare provider because the information has exploded to massive level. Um, and yes, yes, yes. Sir. So I went to the Mi Michigan Academy of Family Practitioners, which was great yeah. uh, because it was all these family, they brought their parents, they brought their kids, and on one of the display tables, there were was a pile of 25 sheets of paper stapled together, 50 pages. Each page was something that you should do during the patient encounter. Uh, some only for teenagers or only for old people, but you know, like the clinician cannot fit that all in. That it's just not workable, and yeah. that's why they feel overloaded. So, solution very briefly, it's called the other 45 in Spartanburg. The doctor meets with the patient for 15 minutes, maybe talks for eight and types for eight, and then afterwards, there's a resident there. The patient goes with the resident, and then the resident says, did you understand what the doctor said? And the patient says, well, not really. Uh, does this advice makes sense. Can you afford the medicine? Do you know where to buy the food? And spends 45 minutes kind of connecting the doctor's advice with the patient's reality. And I absolutely agree with that. The, the, the thing is, there's a lot of, in our future of clinics, we talked about models in which the provider or the clinician, whether it's in the form of a nurse or RN or what, whoever is working maximum of their their licensure can be extended out of the health center because what happens is what you get in that limited through you know 10 minutes of typing away is not what truly sticks when they go out they still in the wild wild west okay so it just it truly what it, what we're talking about is we're talking about vitality in which we how do we get patient to the best version of themselves there's a lot of health literacy that takes them there and there's a lot of assumption of risk that needs to take them there. And we, what is happening is we are pushing the responsibility of health and well-being to the wrong places. And the healthcare provider is being locked down in the room typing, the highest paid typist you'll get in the whole world is the healthcare provider when they should be going out and truly helping people to understand health literacy. And they can extend themselves and actually do a better job at it than them going on Dr. Google or Dr. Oz, for example, and getting wrong advice. So there is that, my next question is actually related to that, is risk and incentive. And how do we align our risk or assume risk and incentive to truly uh, promote vitality for people. Before we align the risk, there was a comment from yes. the audience. Yeah, I wanted to say a comment that Michelle said, which is, you know, we are trying to have sort of healthy lifestyle habits, and it's not up to the clinicians or physicians to advise us on that. It's about parenting, right? It's about yes. community. But at the same time, we have a culture and a mindset and a medical community who has been you know, driven to say, use your meds, use your medications. Mm -hmm. This is, and so society, and I deal with this all the time, personally, 
they look to the physicians who say, well, no, this is what science says. But if you say, no, your parenting is awful, then they say, no, well, well let's listen to the physicians. So I think we need more lifestyle uh, physicians, medicine physicians. We need more people in here in authority sharing this with the community more so. And then parents will actually start understanding that it's in their own, that they can take it's really up to them. But right now, they're following the lead. Well, and physicians want that education, to your point. They want to know more about, they don't like it when patients come to them and they don't know, you know, what good nutrition is. I mean, I remember going to my own doctor when I was 16 and asking, you know, because I was a very chubby tomboy, or like, why, does I, why don't I look like my sister and my brother because they were very slim? And he was like, well, just, you know, pile on you know, whatever you want on your plate and just eat 20% of that. I mean, that's not nutrition. I mean, and in my head, I was like, cool, I can pile on, you know, a thousand donuts and just eat 20%. I'm good. You know, so, I mean, and that's literally my thinking um, at the time, which made me really interested in nutrition because that's not the way. But unfortunately, medical education doesn't really spend enough time in learning about and teaching physicians about nutrition. And so physicians want an, an area to actually be able to learn about this. And I think it's really physicians who are practicing lifestyle medicine to really push this forward in a scientific way. I want to say to Munjal, we're on the same team. We're not, we're not saying anything that's yeah. in opposition. We, we want to be on your team or to have you on ours. Um, and <laughs> And, and I would say that the biggest disservice that modern medicine has done since the discovery of penicillin is to dissociate ourselves from lifestyle, from food, really. And, and you, you, know, you, you could go to be discharged from the hospital for just about any condition and ask, okay, what about my food? What should I be eating? Oh, I don't know. Just take these medicines. And that's, that's all I was taught. So, so for us to get back into that conversation and take back the authority that, that we, we earned, you know, we, we have the credentials, we need to have the expertise to back it up. So what about the risk with that? Align, aligning that, yes. What about the risk? Please, I, I want to start that with the story that the neuropace has. And I, I read that, it was like mind blowing. So I have this patient who was on like five different seizure medications and she couldn't drive. And she had to get a driver, you had to, uh, you didn't have a driver's license. Her life was disrupted completely. She was a productive woman, intelligent, but she had seizure disorder, she can't get to work. And then they placed this device, Neuropace, in, into her brain, and now she can drive. So what I wanted to also drive is that you don't have to not have bad news work for you, but you can be the most vital or best version of yourself despite of that bad news. And that's why assuming risk and incentive is a question that I have for, one, to start from the insurance side of it, and then we can kind of slowly trickle down. And how do we divide up this risk that the health of a person is, is assuming? And is who is responsible for it? The patient, the payer, the provider? And how do we figure out somewhat of a ROI, so to say, of the work that the lifestyle physicians are doing, or you know, Optum is doing, and it's things that they're putting. How do they incentivize that so we can truly assume risk in the right place? So it's funny to be the insurance guy in the room. I've never been that before, but um, and I would say talk to our actuaries would be a nice way to punt. But um, what I would say is it is still all about the data, and so the second you tell that story and we can connect that, boom, it's covered. And covered in a big way, and it's part of the plan. Um, so the degree that the technology can support the physician, so the evidence-based guidelines that nobody can keep up with, and the ability to understand drug interactions, and all those things that technology AI is really good for, um, is a big piece of it. There are some uh, players out there, EdLogix and others, that are doing health literacy types of content. And there's been, you know, ages of it with HealthWise and the old school patient education teams. So the space is not new. I love hearing it because I'm like a health literacy kind of uh, person in our organization. Um, the risks, and every time I try to do something innovative, it's always about, well, if the data lines up, then we will take the risk.
If you get a return within two years, typically. Yeah, I mean, it really varies in our organization, and it can be a very much of a social good, too. I mean, we have a new value pillar around um, does it do social good as well. So if it's neutral or if it's covering itself, we have many employers that are happy to fund it. So think about the commercial space, not just a Medicaid or a Medicare space, that they'll go well beyond the ROI in all these cases, this VOI piece. So she means it when she says the time's up, so I'm gonna put this down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go quick. Um, look, I, I think on the ROI, there's a point that Esther was making that I learned the very first time I tried, started looking at a preventative work and why aren't we doing more of it. And the fact is that the average person stays with their employer three years, and so their average person stays with their insurance three years. And so if you do do a bunch of preventative work and you test them for this and you see if they're pre-diabetic, the value will accrue to the next insurance company or most likely will accrue to Medicare. And so when you, uh, we have yet to set up an incentive system that properly kind of handles that and that properly allocates for that. We've seen data on the health literacy. Uh, now we've, we've been tracking these millions of people who took their health IQ and the death rate is literally the mortality rate of these people is 36% lower for those who score in the top 50th percentile by health IQ versus the bottom 50th percentile. We're about to roll out a Medicare, a welcome to Medicare kind of version of this just to prepare 65 year olds. And I bet we're going to see an even bigger kind of skew in the data, in the mortality data over the next five years as we track that. But you got to, um, but the system doesn't want to invest today in some of this. Like I'll, another really simple example is an A1C is a rolling 90-day average of your blood sugar, but it's actually weighted in the first 30 days the most, and then in the second 30, a little bit less, you know, less and less. And they'd say, hey, there's no point in running another A1C on you for... 90 days, but if you're trying to lose weight and you're working really hard on your diet, you got to get some feedback. Like 90 days is a long time to kind of keep plugging away without knowing if you've made any difference. And, uh, and the weight scale might not be the right answer, as we heard on the other ends. But, you know, that's like a $12, $15 test, but there isn't ROI typically in that because that's a behavioral psychological thing. It's not a scientific thing. Scientific thing says, hey, wait 90 days, but actually there is a scientific thing there because now you may be more adherent. So. You can have fructosamine that'll give you 14 days worth. <laughs> um, the real quick comment on the incentives is that the, in the current system, the incentives between the payer, the provider, and the patient aren't aligned. Yeah. So the first step could be just to align those three. Uh, and, yeah. Right, and that, that, would, that would cover a lot of the problem. Um, another really brief comment is an old joke that is, of course, true. What makes a good marriage is when each side contributes 60%. <laughs> That's clever. Uh, She's doing the math, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it takes a while. Hey, well, my co-host skills are coming back in play. Um, yeah, I think also, in, when it comes to companies, I think when you're looking at incentivizing, you can actually, you can put, I mean, they did this with physician wellness. For every every year you don't, you don't uh, start to care about a physician, you end up losing X amount of dollars at the end of the year, and it costs X amount to train them back. And so when companies are looking at um, retention, which is a really big problem, especially in Silicon Valley, because so many uh, young professionals tend to jump, it's how do you retain them? And actually, healthcare is the biggest driver and retaining them. And so you can actually follow these metrics for their health care from a wellness perspective, from a lifestyle perspective, and uh, that will actually keep them in the company longer and add more value to the employee and the employer. Um, and that's one way to incentivize both sides around the board. Yeah, I, it's, it's a really... It's a great question. I don't. Th I don't know if there's an answer. I mean, it's a really difficult problem of just uh, uh, thinking about uh, risk sharing, responsibility. Whose is it? I mean, ultimately, it's the individual. Um, but we just talked about like an individual is kind of a product of their community. Um, so, like being health literate and just understanding, like, like really deep in your psychology, like what are you influenced by? Like, who, who or what shapes your opinion? Is it someone you know? Is it someone you don't know, like an authority? And if it's an authority, like, where do you hear it? Do you hear it one-on-one -on -one from your physician, which scales terribly for the doc? Or did you get it from the internet 
And you know, there it's just more of a distribution play. Like, was it in front of your face when you felt like reading it? Was it entertaining with the right colors and the right font? I, so I, yeah, I, I mean, I think like maybe it all comes down to Esther's effort, right? Like, if we can bring people up in a literate way so that they can consume information in a way that's smart and that makes sense and it's based on ev evidence and like we embrace science, you know, may, you know, maybe that's the answer. It comes down to the individual. I think that's a good way to end it. Looks like we've been told we have to end. That's <laughs>